so uh, I promised you this argument that free group factor. So last time I introduced property gamma. Uh, so here's the definition right here due to Marine von Neumann. And that is a tracial von Neumann algebra has property gamma. If there exists a net of unitaries uh, such that they have trace zero um, and, uh, and such that they asymptotically commute with, um, with, uh, with things in X. Actually, in this general form, I should probably say more than just trace zero. I should probably say, uh, in fact, that the UIs go to zero uh, weekly. Of course, if it's, uh, if it's a factor, then this will automatically be satisfied by them being trace zero. But uh, you can define this property even for non-factors, and, and then I'll say this. Uh, OK. Uh, so I gave you one example of property gamma, which uh, is written right here. So the hyperfinite 2 one factor, which you can think of as uh, so, uh, an inductive limit of these 2n by 2n matrix algebras. So you just take the 2 by 2 matrices, tensor product themselves, n times. Uh, and this is naturally isomorphic to, uh, so this, whatever in here, is naturally isomorphic to the uh, 2n by 2n matrices. And you include them each in the next. Uh, and these, of course, all have a normalized trace. And you take the union. The union gives you an algebra. It gives you a star algebra. But you have this normalized trace on the union. And since you have the normalized trace, you can do the G and S construction. And the hyperfinite 2 one factor is the closure of this algebra in the G and S construction. Okay. Um, so we're, you know, uh, not being particularly rigorous on the construction of the hyperfinite 2 one factor. Uh, but you can also find this rigorously in, in many books. Um, and like I said, once we have that, well, here are explicit unitaries, which when you write in this form as tensor product of two by two matrices, then here are these unitaries. You just take um, one to be the first n uh, identity, maybe I should say, in the first n copies of the two by two matrices. And then you take uh, this, your favorite trace zero matrix right here. Uh, and these give you then trace zero uh, unitaries. And as you push this part of the matrix, when you push it more and more to the right, then it's going to commute with larger and larger subspaces. And then therefore, it'll asymptotically commute with everything since these larger subspaces will be dense and all of R. So they'll, therefore, that's what I said. So therefore, R has property gamma, and therefore, anything tensor R has uh, always has property gamma. So, so these are examples of property gamma. And I promised a proof that free group factors don't have property gamma. Uh, so to do that, I'm going to give this uh, theorem of Ephros. Well, first a definition and then a theorem. Uh, so here's a definition. So Ephros. And that is. Uh, group gamma is interamenable if there exists a conjugation invariant state phi on L infinity of gamma such that be restricted to C naught of gamma is identically zero. So if you remember inner amina or amenability, uh, so this is a definition, I guess, uh, if we want amenable groups, so say gamma is finite or, uh, well, it's inner amenable if it's finite or there exists such a thing. Uh, I think finite groups are generally considered inner. Uh, if it is finite or there exists. Um, so if you remember amenable groups were exactly the groups that there existed a left invariant uh, state on L infinity of gamma. And if you're infinite, that would automatically 
give you this condition uh, for infinite mutable for, for that. And it's not difficult. In fact, it's maybe a good exercise for people to think about. Um, but uh, if you have a left invariant state, you can also make it simultaneously right invariant for amenable groups. And hence, it'll also be conjugation invariant. Uh, so this is, here's a good exercise. I'm going to show that every amenable group is inner amenable. So that's a good, nice exercise if you want to get a feeling for these, these things. Uh, I should maybe also put out a couple remarks and that maybe this isn't quite how Ephros defined it. Uh, so Ephros defined it maybe that phi of the identity, uh, phi of the, the Dirac function at the identity was zero. Um, but uh, if it's, uh, if, if, it's um, if it's ICC, then this is equivalent to C restricted to C not being zero. Um, so this maybe is slightly different than Ephros's definition, but it agrees with it certainly when the group is ICC, which is the main case that Ephros was concerned about. But I mentioned this just because in the literature, uh, so for instance, if your group has finite center, then uh, this definition does not necessarily mean it's inner amenable, but uh, Ephros's definition uh, that he originally gave technically would allow that to be inner amenable. Um, so I just mentioned that because in the literature, you'll see maybe both definitions used equally as much. Um, so we should be a little, little bit careful about the definition. Uh, so for ICC groups, they're, they're equivalent. Uh, so that's the exercise here and uh, the argument I was going to make. So here's the theorem of Ephros. And that is that if L gamma has property gamma, so then gamma is intermediate. Yeah, maybe property gamma is a bit unfortunate terminology that stuck. Uh, I believe Murray and von Neumann introduced it just because it was the fourth property in a list of uh, properties they were, they were listing, or third property in a list of properties they were listing. So I don't think it has partic any particular, uh, you know, the letter gamma I don't think has any particular significance. Uh, I believe they use the lowercase gamma. Um, but in any case, the terminology is, is well established at this point, so I don't think it's going to change. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and give a proof of this. So here's the proof. So L gamma, L gamma has property gamma, so there exists some UNs, unitaries in L gamma, uh, such that we get that the UGANAs go to zero in the weak operator topology. And we have that the asymptotically commute with, uh, so this in norm two, goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And this is for all x in L gamma. So if this is true for all X and L gamma in particular, it's true for the unitaries coming from the group. And this is all we'll actually use in this proof. Um, so we get uh, specifically, we know that L2 of L gamma with respect to the canonical trace, I'll just write tau. So remember every group von Neumann algebra comes with its canonical faithful normal trace. Um, and we have an isomorphism, a natural isomorphism between this and L2 of the gamma, uh, L2 of gamma, and this isomorphism takes uh, lambda t hat and it sends it to the Dirac function at t. 
Uh, so this is when we introduced the GNS construction here, I made this remark that you have this canonical isomorphism in, in this case. Uh, so what can we do? Well, therefore, we under this isomorphism, we can view these UNs as uh, vectors in L2. And of course, since the UNs are unitaries, they're going to be unit vectors in L2. So we get that, therefore, uh, UN hat uh, give unit vectors in L2 of gamma. And uh, what else do we know? Well, we know that they're almost, uh, they almost commute with elements of the group on Iman algebra, so in particular with elements of the group. So we get uh, that lambda t u n lambda t, let me put a hat here to emphasize that we're thinking of these in L2, minus u n hat. In norm two, this goes to zero as n goes to infinity, and this is for all t and gamma. But now, I'm just gonna start it. But now remember, what is this action by conjugation here? Well, it's nothing but, uh, so we have the action on the left by lambda t, so that's the left regular representation, and the action on the right by lambda t star is the right regular representation. So when we view it over in this picture here of L2 of gamma, then this is the left regular representation times the right regular representation. So that's just conjugation. Uh, so this is equal to, uh, so lambda t rho t un hat minus un hat on norm two. So this goes zero as n goes to infinity. So that exactly says that these vectors, they're almost invariant under this representation on L2. So we can do what we've done before, and we can then define uh, a state uh, on L infinity by just taking the inner product with these. Uh, this is the same thing we did for amenability. So we define states, the N, on L infinity gamma by the n of some function f is equal to, so L infinity of gamma, I'm gonna view this as sitting inside of bounded operators on L2 of gamma. And I'm gonna define phi n of this by just the corresponding this. So these give states on this uh, C strand algebra, these are unit vectors, so this gives uh, states. And then what do we know? Well, what is this condition up here actually saying? So we have that uh, phi n, and then I'll write the conjugation action by L t r t. So that's the action on L infinity by conjugation. So that's how I'm going to denote it. Um, and so, but what is L t r t? Uh, but that's nothing but just um, uh, LT is conjugation by the left regular representation, RT is conjugation by the right regular representation. So this is just uh, lambda T rho T F, lambda T star rho T star UN hat U. But now we can move the lambda t rows to the other side. And so this is f lambda t star rho t star one hat uh, lambda t star rho t star one hat. And then you see from our estimate up here that lambda t rho t un uh, is very close to un itself. So we get that this, uh, so what do we get? We get that therefore EN of LT RT, so the action by conjugation minus EN of F. So this an absolute value, and this is the soup 
Oh, well, uh, yeah. So this in absolute value is going to be less than or equal to, and then I just replace the UNs. So we're going to get an F here, infinity norm of F, and then we're going to get uh, UN minus lambda T rho T UN hat. And then two, and we probably get two of them by doing the transient inequality. Uh, so, so this is the inequality we get. Uh, in particular, what does this mean? This means that therefore, if we take, so these are all states on L infinity, so we can take any uh, weak star cluster point. So let E be any weak star accumulation point. of these PNs. So then we actually get that uh, this is equal to zero. Uh, since this is uniform over F infinity, so we'll actually get that this is zero. So we'll get that phi, N, phi of LT RT of F minus phi of F is equal to zero for all T. Uh, and finally, the last thing we need to know is what if we put a C0 function in uh, also phi uh, if, if f is in C0 of gamma, so then phi of f, this is, uh, you know, the limit of phi n, which is f un hat un. So it's going to be an accumulation points of these. But what do we have? We have that un are converging weakly to zero. And so that means that um, uh, so that means that the coefficients of un, each coefficient is going to zero. And f is a C naught function, which means after some finite number of points in your group, the infinity norm of f is going to be very small. But because the uns are converging weakly to zero, that means their coefficients all live uh, off this finite set eventually. So we get that this uh, actually converges to zero as an, oops, uh, for any c0 function. Uh, because all it is is picking up, you know, f is c0, so it's only picking up, it's only, you know, larger than epsilon and a finite number of points and the UNs converge weakly to zero, which means in the Hilbert space, they also converge weakly uh, to zero so that uh, they can't be large on these finite limit points. All right, so that shows that the state we get actually uh, gives us zero. So this uh, is Efros's argument that shows uh, property gamma implies intermediate. I should remark here that the converse of Efros's theorem is not true, although it was an open problem for quite a while. Um, but it was, uh, I believe, I want to say like 2010 or somewhere around there. I can look it up right here, 2012. So in 2012, uh, 2012, uh, Stefan Voss gave an example an example of a group, an, an ICC group, gamma such that um, uh, gamma is interamenable, but L gamma does not have property gamma. So this theorem of Efros, the converse is, is not true of Efros's theorem. And the, the issue is, is that in Efros's theorem, what do we actually use to prove it? It was only that the sequence commuted with the, absentotically commuted with the group elements. Um, and, uh, uh, or what do, I mean, what do I mean to say? In order to get interamenability, we didn't use anywhere that the UNs were unitaries. This, this is the key point. All we used is that they were norm two vectors which converged weakly to zero. 
We didn't use anywhere that they're unitaries or that they were uniformly bounded in, in L infinity norm. And this is exactly the point. Uh, to find a counterexample the other way, you have to control the where these means, you have to find an interminable group and you have to control sufficiently well where the means are. So that way you can make sure that you get vectors in L2 here, um, which asymptotically commute with the group elements, but you can't get uniformly bounded. So you can't get unitaries, which commute asymptotically with, with, with these elements. And that's exactly what Stefan Voss did by a clever play of uh, building property T groups inside of other property T groups so you could really control uh, where these means, where this, these interminable groups lived, where the means lived. Uh, so I should also remark here that interminability is the existence of some state for some action on some set. So specifically, we're looking at the action of a set on, on conjugation. And this is something we already did before, so I'll just uh, remark on that. So if we have a gamma acting on some set S, a set, so then uh, the following are equivalent, and that is one, there exists a gamma invariant state on L infinity of S such that uh, state B, so such that phi restricted to C naught of S is uh, identically zero. Two, there exist Cn in L2 of S, uh, Cn univectors, and Cn converging to zero weakly. such that they're almost invariant. So such that gamma times Cn minus Cn in line two uh, and this L2 norm goes to zero and gamma. gamma. Uh, three, uh, well, I'll just leave it like that. Right, that these are in fact equivalent and this is for any set. And we already proved this back when we did uh, amenability. If you look at our proof for amenability, when our group was acting on itself by left multiplication, uh, we gave a proof for this. And it works equally well in this general, general setting. And the only thing maybe to check, the only thing we didn't do before is that you get this extra condition uh, if you get this condition. That's the only thing we haven't checked, but I'll, I'll leave it up to you guys. So in fact, uh, you know, in Efros's proof, we constructed this sequence, and then from that we constructed the mean. But also using Day's trick and Namioka's trick, you can go back and and construct this approximately uh, invariant sequence. Uh, okay. So that's property gamma. So now we can prove quite easily that free groups do not have property gamma, which was originally, or free group factors don't have property gamma, which was originally Marine von Neumann. So the theorem is that uh, F2 uh, is not interminable. And just like with amenability, uh, we can see this through a paradoxical decomposition. So let's draw the Cayley graph of F2. All right, so here's the Cayley graph of F2. And then again, just like we did before, we can define certain subsets. So these are all, I'm gonna call this subset A. So it's all words that in reduced form begin with the letter A. So this is all words in reduced form, which looked like W is equal to A times sub W prime. Um, and then you also have uh, what I'll call A uh, minus one over here. So these are all things that start with an A inverse on the left. 
And then you also have this subset of the calograph up here, which are all things that start with a B. And we have this subset down here, which are all things that start with uh, a B inverse. So these are four subsets of a uh, free group. So notice that here we haven't covered the identity. So I should remark on what is this condition. So this condition, of course, is to rule out the simple uh, state that you could just take evaluation at the identity. And for any group, so this is in the definition here. Oops. This is in the definition. So for any group, you could, of course, consider uh, evaluation at the identity elements in L infinity. And that's a perfectly nice conjugation and variant state. More generally, if you had a uh, finite normal subgroup, then you could consider the uh, average of, of the evaluation of conjugation on elements of that finite subgroup. And that would be, again, an invariant state. But that's why we pose this condition to rule out such silly examples. So this means that the state we get doesn't come from, say, evaluation at the identity or even averaging evaluation on a finite normal subgroup. So these, these examples are silly. Uh, so that's why we pose, impose this extra condition. So on the Cayley graph of the free group, so we don't quite cover the free group. We leave the origin open, but like I said, that's okay because we have that extra condition. Uh, and so then uh, what do we notice? Well, just like before, um, if we and now instead of multiplying, uh, say, A inverse on the left by A, if we conjugate this A sub negative one by inverse, uh, and let's think of what we get in here. So a negative one were all things that started with an a. And so uh, I start with an a inverse. So we'll get some cancellation on the left. And in particular, if we had any word that had a b in it, then we can always write it as a times a inverse times uh, that thing with a b in it. Right? So we never get uh, more cancellation. Let's see, is that uh, clear? Uh, yeah, if we get something that starts with a B, that's exactly right. If we get something that starts with a B, then we can always write it as A times A inverse times that thing and then times A inverse by A at the end. So we get that B, anything that starts with a B on the left, is of course going to be contained in this subset. And similarly, anything that starts with a B inverse, you can also write it that way. So we also get B sub negative one is also contained in this. Uh, Okay, uh, so let's see. So what does this mean? So this means that therefore, whatever this phi is, when we plug in the characteristic function of if we have a conjugate conjugation invariant mean, a conjugation invariant state, uh, so then we would have this is certainly less than or equal to phi of A inverse. But for the same reason, we also have, we also have um, that A sub negative one union A is going to be contained in say B. Uh, well, I guess B, uh, inverse or it's just a symmetric situation. So B and negative one inverse. So we can say that this is also less than or equal to say phi applied to the characteristic function that B 
negative one. Which is then, of course, less than or equal to Right, and then the string of inequalities says that we have equality, but of course, b and b sub negative one are disjoint, so this is also equal to b of characteristic function b negative one plus b characteristic function b. And since we have e equality for all of these, in particular, that says that this has to be zero. So the conclusion is, is that therefore phi of the characteristic function of b is equal to zero. But you can see completely by symmetry, you can uh, do the same way and show that all four of these sets are zero. So similarly, uh, phi, all four of these are zero. So that means that the only thing left over is exactly evaluation at the end. Of it. So therefore, so if phi in L infinity of F2 star is a conjugation invariant state, so then we have all this, hence phi of just the Dirac function at the identity is equal to one. So phi is just evaluation at the identity, this, this state that we always have. So in particular, it doesn't vanish on C0. So. Um, you have to also state, right, the, uh, that, that these functions are, are not in C0, which is obvious because they're infinite sets. Uh, actually, we, no, I don't use that anywhere, that's fine. Uh, all I show is that we have these five sets, five disjoint subsets of a free group, and I show that four of them have measure zero. So therefore, the other one has measure one, mean one. All right, so that shows that uh, free groups are not interamenable. Uh, let me give you another example of a group which is not interamenable. Um, and that is uh, SL2Z. Now SL2Z, uh, so this is not interminable. So SL2Z has a finite index subgroup, which is a free group. Uh, and so from that, you can, you can show pretty easily that it's not interminable. But let me give you a proof in a very different flavor, which uses more of the geometry of SL2Z. So let's give a proof of this. And uh, so the proof of this I'm going to give is uh, a geometric uh, argument we've seen before. So SL2Z naturally acts, actually this will work for any discrete, uh, any lattice in um, uh, SL2R. So SL2Z, let me call this gamma. And this acts on uh, projective real space. Right, the space of lines. So just its action on R2 uh, you, gives you an action on the space of lines. And this gives you an action here. And this is a um, uh, yeah, so this is by fractional linear transformations, if you like, if you identify this with the extended, with the extended real uh, fractional linear transformations. So we have this natural action here. Actually, all of SL2R does. So let me write that in there. all of SL2R acts by fractional linear transformations here. And uh, the thing I'll use about S SL2R is that if you have any, say, um, uh, G in SL2R, so it's a two by two matrix, uh, 
So we know we can take its polar decomposition. So we can write G to be K times uh, H, where K is uh, unitary, so it'll be in uh, SO2, two. two by two orthogonal matrices, and H is positive. Uh, so it's a positive, positive definite thing. So it'll be invertible because of course it's in the group. Uh, but now we use the fact that any positive matrix can of course be diagonalized, which means that H can be conjugated uh, by orthogonal matrices to a diagonal matrix. So you can see that uh, H is conjugate uh, H is diagonalizable. And hence, we can write G as, well, it'll be K, and then there'll be another K coming from diagonalizing H, so that'll be K1. And now we have a diagonal matrix A, and now we have K2. And of course, we can all, always uh, change Again, by conjugating by an orthogonal matrix, we can change A such that its eigenvalues are, say, in decreasing order. And we know that H is positive, so it has positive value eigenvalues. So we can write G is equal to K1, A, K2, uh, where uh, A is going to be uh, lambda and then one over lambda zero zero with lambda greater than one greater than or equal. So this is the so-called KAK decomposition. So we have uh, that SL two R is of the form K A plus K where K is SO2 and A plus our diagonal matrices with our positive diagonal entries in decreasing order. So it's not a subgroup, it's a subset of the diagonal subgroup. Uh, so any SL, any matrix can be written this way. Of course, you could have also done this with SLN. So that's something maybe to think about as well. Uh, so what does this mean for the action? So this means that in particular, if we had a sequence of elements from SL2R, so if we are looking at SL2Z inside, and if we have a sequence of elements, uh, what does that mean? Well, first consider the case. Uh, so if we have a n, which are like this. So let me start over. If we take t n and say s l to z, such that uh, t n goes to infinity and t n as KAK decomposition, say KN uh, and then lambda N, one over lambda N, zero, zero, and then KN tilde. Let's say we have KAK decomposition like this. Well, then what do we know? Well, we know that this is SL2Z is the discrete subgroup of SL2R, and the Ks are in some compact subgroup. So we know that therefore this uh, diagonal sequence has to uh, go to, um, has to escape every compact set. And so that means that the lambda n's have to go to infinity okay? because we know they're greater than one. Uh, and so to escape every compact set, they have to go to infinity. So we get therefore lambda n 
goes to infinity. Uh, but now let's think of how does this diagonal matrix act? And, and of course, by taking subsequences, we can assume that these uh, orthogonal matrices converge. So let's also assume, assume Kn converges to some K infinity and Kn tilde converges to some K infinity tilde, and these are in SO. by taking some subsequence if we need to. Uh, so what does this mean? This means that uh, basically, what does Tn look like? What does a matrix look like here? It's gonna be some orthogonal transformation, K infinity, so some change of basis. And then we multiply by this diagonal matrix, uh, and then we take another change of basis. So we need to understand how does this diagonal matrix act by fractional linear transformations? And how does it act? Well, we just write it out. So remember how this acts by fractional linear transformations. It's just gonna be lambda n z plus zero over zero plus one over lambda n. So that's just lambda n squared times z. So it just acts by multiplication by some very, very large positive number. So now we think of what does this actually mean geometrically on the real line or on the circle. So here we have the origin and we go out and we have infinity at the end. And these are both fixed points uh, by this transformation that we have these transformations we have here. And every other point, as we apply this diagonal matrix AN, it's gonna send it to infinity. So it's gonna fix zero, it's gonna fix infinity, and every other point is gonna to converge to infinity. Right, so as we apply this, uh, this sequence AN, so if this is, uh, so this is AN here. So as we apply AN, it's gonna take some point here and it's gonna move it very far. It takes some point here and it'll move it very far to infinity. So this is what these diagonal transformations. Now, of course, we have this uh, change of basis in this K infinity and K infinity tilde. Uh, so the sequence in the end here uh, won't take everything to infinity because of course we've rotated this, uh, the real line. And so, and same with zero, it won't fix zero because we've rotated it. But what we get is the following north-south dynamics. Uh, which states that uh, if Tn are in SL2z, or indeed even an SL2R, uh, such that Tn converges to infinity. So then, uh, after passing to a subsequence, after passing, uh, there exists some a and B in uh, projective space. So let's say R union infinity, such that uh, Tn of uh, say X converges, our T sub N sub K, we pass to a subsequence, converges to B for all X not equal to A. So this is this north-south dynamics that uh, SL2R possesses. Uh, so how does this help us uh, you know, how is this related to property uh, inter or inner amenability? Of course, there are e like I said, there are easier ways to prove inner amenability, but I wanted to give you this because it'll come up later in the course. 
uh, so what can we do here? Well, it's not hard to see that in fact, if you take every point to be except for one possible point, then you also do this, uh, say for any open subset. In fact, for any, so the complement of any neighborhood of, B, of A rather. In fact, if uh, O1 and, or say OA and OB, our neighborhoods of A and B, respectively. So then uh, there exists some K such that for K larger than or equal to K, uh, we have that T sub N sub K times the complement of the neighborhood of A is entirely contained in the neighborhood of B. All right, so this is this picture I drew before that if you take any, say, neighborhood of zero here, then in the complement of that neighborhood of zero, you can push it all into any neighborhood of infinity that you want. So you can move this entire, you can move this entire set here and you can put it inside the red set. So that's what we're saying here. So this is the sort of north-south dynamics. Uh, so what do I want to do with this? Well, in particular, what this means is that therefore, if we take, if we let, uh, say, mu to be Lebesgue measure, on the real line, say union infinity, of course it gives measure zero to any singleton, so it's just Lebesgue measure on the real line, uh, and maybe Lebesgue measure on the circle. So this is probably, uh, I should say on the circle, rather. so isomorphic to the torus. So I want a probability measure, Lebesgue probability measure. Um, so if we take Lebesgue measure on the real line, then what does that mean? That means when we push forward this measure, what's gonna happen? Well, we see that on any set, so of course it's a Lebesgue measure, so it has no atoms. So we can find some neighborhood of this point A that has measure less than epsilon. And then when we apply the transformation T sub NK, we move the entire complement. So the complement has measure one minus, greater than one minus epsilon. And we move it all within an arbitrary neighborhood of B. So what does this mean? This means that when we take this measure and we start pushing it forward, it's gonna put more and more, it's gonna put more and more concentration on any neighborhood of B but that just means that it's going to tend weak star to evaluation at B. So when this converges weak star to the Dirac evaluation at B. Not only that, but actually we didn't need anything about Lebesgue measure. All we need is that it was just any measure without atoms, the any any probability measure without atoms. Then we had uh, on this, then we had that this sequence or any subsequence, uh, some subsequence converges to some Dirac function here. Now, the nice thing is, is that, like I said, it's with any probability measure without atoms. So that means, uh, but you notice that the limit has nothing to do with mu. 
So a kind of this transformation, this north-south dynamics, what it tells us is that we kind of collapse the entire measure space, the entire space of measures onto this one single measure. All right, so this is a really powerful action. Uh, so what do we get from this instead? In particular, if we have any uh, other measure H, so or if, if we took any other element of the group, so if G is in SL2Z, so then T and K and G mu also converges peak star to the Dirac measure at B. And that was true for every single G. In particular, if we subtract these two things, then we get a sequence of uh, signed measures which converge weak star to zero. So in particular, So therefore, uh, so what are we, uh, so if, let me summarize uh, what we've done so far. If mu is a probability measure on this space, this is a nice compact house towards space without uh, atoms. And if we take any sequence, Tn in gamma such that it tends to infinity. Uh, gamma here is SL2. Uh, Tn going to infinity. Uh, so then there exists a subsequence. such that for all G and SL2 uh, Z or SL2 R even, uh, we have Tn mu minus Tn G mu converges to zero weak star, uh, Tn sub K. Weak star to zero. So this is the key property we've established here. Now you can uh, soup up this property slightly, slightly more. Uh, in fact, what you can show, maybe I'll do this as a lemma next time. So in fact, because this, because it was for every sequence, every infinite sequence had a subsequence. So you can show that if it's every infinite sequence has a subsequence, which, which this happens to, then you can show this happens for every sequence. In fact, we have that Tn mu minus Tn g mu goes to zero weak star uh, as n goes to infinity. And this is for all g and k. So this is the key property that I want to focus on. So we've established that uh, SL2Z or even any discrete subgroup of SL2R has this property that any sequence, any infinite sequence in the group, any sequence in the group that tends to infinity and any group element, we have this weak star convergence for some fixed measure on some, on, on this particular action. Um, okay, so now let me give you a quick proof that SL2R is not interminable from this perspective, but we'll see we'll actually prove much, much more from this perspective. So suppose, uh, so now what I wanna do is I wanna define uh, define this map 
phi mapping continuous functions on our union this to L infinity of gamma by phi f at t is equal to the integral of f d t u. Uh, maybe I need an inverse here for this t. We'll find out in a second. So then uh, the thing to notice is what is this? Uh, so let's look at what is phi of lt rt uh, of, sorry, other way around. What is the action by conjugation lt rt p of f? Uh, maybe I should have maybe put an x here. Um, x. So this is equal uh, to what? So this is equal to the integral. Well, it's b of f at t inverse x t, which is then equal to the integral of f d t inverse x t mu. So the t inverse here, this just becomes the action of, uh, so this just becomes f compose t inverse here, d x t mu. Um, okay, so now what can we do is we see that as x tends to infinity, this right here, this t goes away. So we see that if now, if phi in L infinity of gamma is a conjugation invariant state such that phi restricted to C naught of gamma is identically zero. So then we could consider lowercase phi compose capital phi. And what do we see here? We see that if we subtract, if we take this function and we subtract off uh, this thing without the T, so we see that this uh, is a C zero function. So this note, so this gives a state on continuous functions on the real line. And this, uh, and such that if we look at phi compose this, and now I have LT, uh, So F compose T inverse. We see that this from the computation I did down here, just replacing things, this is phi compose. And now we have here uh, L T R T phi of f. So notice this, uh, maybe I should make that more explicit. So the point is, is that this, that's, that's the argument I want to make. So when we plug in phi of this LTRT phi f, we get this, but we see that this doesn't, since phi is zero on C zero, this doesn't depend on finitely many x's. So therefore we, this only depends, this formula only depends on the asymptotics of X. And when we take asymptotics, the T right here goes away. So this T right here, we can remove because of this property. Right, so what we get therefore is once we remove T, then all that's left is F composed T inverse, which is what I wrote here. So that justifies, that's why this is justified. So we use this, uh, property that justifies this equality here. 
to this T. Well, now we use that V as conjugation invariant, and we see that this is just equal to V compose V of T. So we see that if we were interamenable, we would get this conjugation invariant state, and this would then give us a state on, on this space here, which was invariant. And of course, here we have the, re the Reese representation theorem. So the conclusion is, is that then uh, we would have that uh, gamma has a uh, invariant probability measure on R1. But we also saw that gamma just being infinite had this north-south dynamics. So having an invariant measure, we knew that it pushed all the measures to Dirac functions at either this north point or the south point or a combination of two. So this would then, we would conclude that gamma uh, fixes either a point or a pair of points in R. But of course, you, we have an explicit description of the stabilizers of these points, and the stabilizers are all going to be uh, you can just see what they are. They're just going to be abelian or some index to extension of something that's abelian. So this then gives a contra contradiction. In fact, it implies gamma is amenable if that were the case. And then it would be virtually abelian, in fact. Um, okay, so this is... Uh, yeah, maybe uh, it's definitely not the easiest way to show that SL2Z is not interamenable, uh, but we'll see starting next time that this is actually a much, much stronger property we proved, uh, a property we introduced a few years ago called proper proximality. And so that'll be the next topic that uh, we'll start uh, to study. Any questions? Oh, yes. Uh, can I ask a quick question? Yes. Oh, uh, uh, I, I don't understand why gamma fix, does gamma, hmm? gamma don't fix any point? Uh, I, because ga, does gamma fix zero and infinity? Uh, so gamma, no. Uh, so gamma here is say SL2Z, so it doesn't fix uh, any point. So it's only the diagonal. So that was the back in this part of the argument here. So I noticed that if we looked at diagonal elements, so they fixed zero and infinity. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, you know, general elements of gamma, you also have these Ks and the KK decomposition. So as Ks change, uh, you see yeah, so it's only any kind of any infinite sequence you take asymptotically, you have these north-south dynamics, so you fix two points, but choosing different sequences, so it's only subsequences, choosing different sequences, you get different points that are the north point and the south point. Oh, I see. Thank you. Yeah, so in fact, uh, yeah. Uh, and that was one consequence is that if you have even an invariant measure, then that's only if you fix a point or a pair of points. Um, but you can see quite explicitly what the stabilizers of these points are under fractional linear transformations. Any other questions? All right, let me go ahead and stop here and then uh, we'll pick up more of this 